The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H. P. Lovecraft Part 5 A Nightmare and a Cataclysm Chapter 4 In another moment, he was hastily filling the burned-out lamps from an oil supply he had previously noticed, and when the room was bright again, he looked about to see if he might find a lantern for further exploration. For racked though he was with horror, his sense of grim purpose was still uppermost, and he was firmly determined to leave no stone unturned in his search for the hideous facts behind Charles Ward's bizarre madness. Failing to find a lantern, he chose the smallest of the lamps to carry, also filling his pockets with candles and matches, and taking with him a gallon can of oil, which he proposed to keep for reserve use in whatever hidden laboratory he might uncover beyond the terrible open space, with its unclean altar and nameless covered wells. To traverse that space again would require his utmost fortitude, but he knew it must be done. Fortunately, neither the frightful altar nor the open shaft was near the vast cell-indented wall which bounded the cavern area and whose black mysterious archways would form the next goals of a logical search. So Willet went back to that great pillared hall of stench and anguished howling, turning down his lamp to avoid any distant glimpse of the hellish altar or of the uncovered pit with a pierced stone slab beside it. Most of the black doorways led merely to small chambers, some vacant and some evidently used as storerooms, and in several of the latter he saw some very curious accumulations of various objects. One was packed with rotting and dust-draped bales of spare clothing, and the explorer thrilled when he saw that it was unmistakably the clothing of a century and a half before. In another room he found numerous odds and ends of modern clothing, as if gradual provisions were being made to equip a large body of men. But what he disliked most of all were the huge copper vats which occasionally appeared, these and the sinister incrustations upon them. He liked them even less than the weirdly figured leaden bowls, whose rims retained such obnoxious deposits, and around which clung repellent odours perceptible above, even the general noisomeness of the crypt. When he had completed about half the entire circuit of the wall, he found another corridor like that from which he had come, and out of which many doors opened. This he proceeded to investigate, and after entering three rooms of medium size and of no significant contents, he came at last to a large oblong apartment whose business like tanks and tables, furnaces and modern instruments, occasional books and endless shelves of jars and bottles proclaimed it indeed the long-sought laboratory of Charles Ward, and no doubt of old Joseph Cohen before him. After lighting the three lamps which he found filled and ready, Dr. Willett examined the place and all its appurtenances with the keenest interest, noting from the relative quantities of various reagents on the shelves that young Ward's dominant concern must have been with some branch of organic chemistry. On the whole, little could be learned from the scientific ensemble, which included a gruesome-looking dissecting table, so that the room was really rather a disappointment. Among the books was a tattered old copy of Borelis in black letter, and it was weirdly interesting to note that Ward had underlined the same passage, whose marking had so perturbed good Mr. Merritt at Cowan's farmhouse more than a century and a half before. That older copy, of course, must have perished along with the rest of Cowan's occult library in the final raid. Three archways opened off the laboratory, and these the doctor proceeded to sample in turn. From his cursory survey, he saw that two led merely to small storerooms, but these he canvassed with care, remarking the piles of coffins in various stages of damage, and shuddering violently at two or three of the few coffin plates he could decipher. There was much clothing also stored in these rooms, and several new and tightly nailed boxes, which he did not stop to investigate. Most interesting of all, perhaps, were some odd bits which he judged to be fragments of old Joseph Cohen's laboratory appliances. These had suffered damage at the hands of the raiders, but were still partly recognisable as the chemical paraphernalia of the Georgian period. The third archway led to a very sizable chamber, entirely lined with shelves and having in the centre a table bearing two lamps. These lamps Willet lighted, and in their brilliant glow studied the endless shelving which surrounded him. Some of the upper levels were wholly vacant, but most of the space was filled with small odd-looking leaden jars of two general types, one tall and without handles like a Grecian lekythos or oil jug, and the other with a single handle and proportion like a phalaron jug. All had metal stoppers and were covered with peculiar-looking symbols moulded in low relief. 
In a moment, the doctor noticed that these jugs were classified with great rigidity. All the lekithoi being on one side of the room with a large wooden sign reading Cousteau Days above them, and all the phalerons on the other, correspondingly labelled with a sign reading Materia. Each of the jars or jugs, except some on the upper shelves that turned out to be vacant, bore a cardboard tag with a number apparently referring to a catalogue, and Willett resolved to look for the latter presently. For the moment, however, he was more interested in the nature of the array as a whole, and experimentally opened several of the lekithoi and phalerons at random with a view to a rough generalisation. The result was invariable. Both types of jar contained a small quantity of a single kind of substance a fine dusty powder of very light weight and of many shades of dull, neutral colour. To the colours which formed the only point of variation, there was no apparent method of disposal, and no distinction between what occurred in the lekithoi and what occurred in the phalerons. A bluish-grey powder might be by the side of a pinkish-white one, and any one in a phaleron might have its exact counterpart in a lekithos. The most individual feature about the powders was their non-adhesiveness. Willett would pour one into his hand, and upon returning it to its jug would find that no residue whatever remained on its palm. The meaning of the two signs puzzled him, and he wondered why this battery of chemicals was separated so radically from those in glass jars on the shelves of the laboratory proper. Custo days, materia, that was the Latin for guards and materials, respectively. And then there came a flash of memory as to where he had seen that word guards before in connection with this dreadful mystery. It was, of course, in the recent letter to Dr. Allen purporting to be from old Edward Hutchinson, and the phrase had read, There was no need to keep the guards in shape and eating off their heads, and it made much to be found in case of trouble, as you too well know. What did this signify? But wait, was there not still another reference to guards in this matter? which he had failed wholly to recall when reading the Hutchinson letter. Back in the old non-secretive days, Ward had told him of the Eleazar Smith diary, recording the spying of Smith and Whedon on the Cowan farm, and in that dreadful chronicle, there had been a mention of conversations overheard before the old wizard betook himself, wholly beneath the earth. There had been, Smith and Whedon insisted, terrible colloquies wherein figured Cowan, certain captives of his, and the guards of those captives. Those guards, according to Hutchinson or his avatar, had eaten their heads off, so that now Dr. Allen did not keep them in shape. And if not in shape, how save as the salts to which it appears this wizard band was engaged in reducing as many human bodies or skeletons as they could. So that was what these lekithoi contained. The monstrous fruit of unhallowed rites and deeds, presumably won, or cowed to such submission as to help, when called up by some hellish incantation, in the defence of their blasphemous master, or the questioning of those who were not so willing. Willett shuddered at the thought of what he had been pouring in and out of his hands, and for a moment felt an impulse to flee in panic, from that cavern of hideous shelves with their silent and perhaps watching sentinels. Then he thought of the materia, in the myriad phaleron jugs on the other side of the room. Salts too, and if not the salts of guards, then the salts of what? God! Could it be possible that here lay the mortal relics of half the titan thinkers of all the ages, snatched by supreme ghouls from crypts where the world thought them safe, and subject to the beck and call of madmen who sought to drain their knowledge for some still wilder end, whose ultimate effect would concern, as poor Charles had hinted in his frantic note, all civilization, all natural law, perhaps even the fate of the solar system and the universe. And Marinus Bicknell Willett had sifted their dust through his hands. Then he noticed a small door at the farther end of the room, and calmed himself enough to approach it and examine the crude sign chiselled above. It was only a symbol, but it filled him with vague spiritual dread, for a morbid, dreaming friend of his had once drawn it on paper and told him a few of the things it means in the dark abyss of sleep. It was the sign of cough that dreamers see fixed above the archway of a certain black tower standing alone in twilight and Willett did not like what his friend Randolph Carter had said of its powers. But a moment later he forgot the sign as he recognised a new acrid odour in the stench-filled air. This was a chemical rather than animal smell, and came clearly from the room beyond the door. And it was, unmistakably, the same odour which had saturated Charles Ward's clothing on the day the doctors had taken him away. So it was here that the youth had been interrupted by the final summons. He was wiser than old Joseph Cohen 
for he had not resisted. Willet boldly determined to penetrate every wonder and nightmare this nether realm might contain, seized the small lamp and crossed the threshold. A wave of nameless fright rolled out to meet him, but he yielded to no whim and deferred to no intuition. There was nothing alive here to harm him, and he would not be stayed in his piercing of the eldritch cloud which engulfed his patient. The room beyond the door was of medium size and had no furniture save a table, a single chair, and two groups of curious machines with clamps and wheels, which Willet recognised after a moment as medieval instruments of torture. On one side of the door stood a rack of savage whips, above which were some shelves, bearing empty rows of shallow pedestaled cups, of leads shaped like Grecian kylikes. On the other side was the table, with a powerful argand lamp, a pad and pencil, and two of the stoppered lekathoi from the shelves outside, set down at irregular places, as if temporarily or in haste. Willet lighted the lamp and looked carefully at the pad to see what notes young Ward might have been jotting down when interrupted, but found nothing more intelligible than the following disjointed fragments in that crabbed Cowan chirography, which shed no light on the case as a whole. B died not, escaped into walls and found place below. Saw old V say ye sabaoth and learnt ye way. Raised yog sothoth thrice and was ye next day delivered. F sought to wipe out all knowing how to raise those from outside. As the strong argan blaze lit up the entire chamber, the doctor saw that the wall opposite the door, between the two groups of torturing appliances in the corners, was covered with pegs from which hung a set of shapeless-looking robes of a rather dismal yellowish-white. But far more interesting were the two vacant walls, both of which were thickly covered with mystic symbols and formerly roughly chiselled in the smooth, dressed stone. The damp floor also bore marks of carving, and with but little difficulty Willet deciphered a huge pentagram in the centre, with a plain circle about three feet wide, halfway between this and each corner. In one of these four circles, near where a yellowish robe had been flung carelessly down, there stood a shallow kylix of the sort found on the shelves above the whip rack, and just outside the periphery was one of the phaleron jugs from the shelves in the other room, its tag numbered 118. This was unstoppered and proved upon inspection to be empty, but the explorer saw with a shiver that the kylix was not. Within its shallow area and saved from scattering, only by the absence of wind in this sequestered cavern, lay a small amount of a dry, dull, greenish efflorescent powder which must have belonged in the jug, and Willet almost reeled at the implications that came sweeping over him as he correlated little by little the several elements and antecedents of the scene the whips and the instruments of torture, the dust or salts from the jug of materia, the two lekithoi from the Cousteau day's shelf, the robes, the formulae on the walls, the notes on the pad, the hints from letters and legends, and the thousand glimpses, doubts and suppositions which had come to torment the friends and parents of Charles Ward. All these engulfed the doctor in a tidal wave of horror as he looked at that dry greenish powder outspread in the pedestaled leaden kylix on the floor. With an effort, however, Willet pulled himself together and began studying the formulae chiselled on the walls. From the stained and encrusted letters, it was obvious that they were carved in Joseph Carwin's time and their text was such as to be vaguely familiar to one who had read much Carwin material or delved extensively into the history of magic. One the doctor clearly recognised as what Mrs Ward heard her son chanting on that ominous Good Friday a year before and what an authority had told him was a very terrible invocation addressed to secret gods outside the normal spheres. It was not spelled here exactly as Mrs. Ward had set it down from memory, nor yet as the authority had shown it to him in the forbidden pages of Eliphaz Levy, but its identity was unmistakable, and such words as Sabiath, Metratan, Olmalzan and Zaryatnatnik sent a shudder of fright through the searcher, who had seen and felt so much of cosmic abomination just around the corner. This was on the left-hand wall as one entered the room. The right-hand wall was no less thickly inscribed, and Willett felt a start of recognition as he came upon the pair of formulae so frequently occurring in the recent notes in the library. They were, roughly speaking, the same, with the ancient symbols of dragon's head and dragon's tail heading them as in Ward's scribblings. But the spelling differed quite widely from that of the modern versions, as if old Cohen had had a different way of recording sound or as if later study had evolved more powerful and perfected variants of the invocations in question. 
The doctor tried to reconcile the chiseled version with the one which still ran persistently in his head and found it hard to do. Where the script he had memorized began, Yai Ongunga Yog Sothoth, this epigraph started out as, I Ingenga Yog Sothotha, which to his mind would seriously interfere with the syllabification of the second word. Ground as the later text was into his consciousness, the discrepancy disturbed him, and he found himself chanting the first of the formulae aloud, in an effort to square the sound he conceived with the letters he found carved. Weird and menacing in that abyss of antique blasphemy rang his voice, its accents keyed to a droning sing-song either through the spell of the past and the unknown, or through the hellish example of that dull godless wail from the pits, whose inhuman cadences rose and fell rhythmically in the distance through the stench and the darkness. Yai, Ungunga, Yog Sothoth, He Lujeb, Fuhai Throdog you are. But what was this cold wind which had sprung into life at the very outset of the chant? The lamps were sputtering woefully, and the gloom grew so dense that the letters on the wall nearly faded from sight. There was smoke too, and an acrid odour which quite drowned out the stench from the faraway wells. An odour like that he had smelt before, yet infinitely stronger and more pungent. He turned from the inscriptions to face the room with its bizarre contents, and saw that the kylix on the floor, in which the ominous efflorescent powder had lain, was giving forth a cloud of thick, greenish-black vapour of surprising volume and opacity. That powder! Great God! It had come from the shelf of materia. What was it doing now, and what had started it? The formula he had been chanting, the first of the pair, dragon's head, ascending node, blessed saviour, could it be? The doctor reeled, and through his head raced wildly disjointed scraps from all he had seen, heard, and read of the frightful case of Joseph Carwin and Charles Dexter Ward. I say to you again, do not call up any that you cannot put down. Have you words for laying at all times ready, and stop not to be sure when there is any doubt of whom you have? Three talks with what was therein in hummed. Mercy of heaven, what is that shape behind the parting smoke? 